guys have, are just starting to build? How many of you guys have built guitars and they're all sounding, you're having a hard time controlling your tone and your sound? Okay, we all hear things differently. Now, I'm just going to show you the way that I figured out my bracing, and I'm a very traditional Martin builder. I, I, I love the pre-war, that's what I do. So, if you're trying to learn how to brace your guitars, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it because I'm a firm believer there's more than one way. So if somebody's telling you my way is the only way, shake his hand and find somebody else. Tradition, for me, was the pre-war design. You have your own designs. You have your own ideas. Now, in order to get consistency in bracing, I mean, we all had the guitar and you're sitting there trying to find where the lines for your bracing go. You develop these halos. Now, what the halo is going to do and afford you is A, you can put this on your gear board and draw out your bracing pattern. Now, let's pretend this is your top. You look like you're handy. Hold that for me. Okay, so now you mark your top. Okay? So you have your top all marked out with the bracing pattern. Now you make a halo that matches your bracing pattern. Now what this affords you is you put this on your top and you kind of line up everything. And remember, your, your braces are going to be scale length oriented. But you probably have your own designs. You had a blueprint or whatever. So now when you go to brace your guitar, you can set your braces into these notches. All right? And they are in perfect position. Now what really affords you the great part now is when you have your body you take this up, you turn it upside down, you put that on your body, you know exactly where to place your braces. Because when you're trying to eyeball, you can move this up or down a hair. Now you're going to get consistency in your brace location. You may sit down. <laughs> so you can buy these, I make them, sell them, or you can make your own. So you can see how simple this is. Now as you start to make braces and doing your own bracing, how do you brace? What, how do I voice the top? Well, you know, booba, booba, then you tap on the drum. And now, you can go back and you know exactly what you did the last time. And if you take a piece of paper and put it on your paddle, you can take a mark where you peaked your scalp, where you brought your tail parts in. You can actually make a note on your pattern what you did. And who here, I hope you keep building logs. You all keep building logs, so you keep a note. So now you can start learning the cause and effect relationship for your bracing pattern. Because, I mean, how many of you, anybody here will admit that they put the braces on wrong and you drilled through a bridge plate? Or you missed your bridge plate? You know, we've all done it. We've all, we've all made mistakes. So that's how I started developing this. So now consistency and braces are going to come down to a couple of things. Number one, scale length. So whatever you're going to do in your scale length, you want to make sure that it matches. Now, oh, I got chalk. So this is your brace. I got two pieces of chalk. Okay. So that's your brace. Now you can make a note here. Uh, anybody here not familiar with Robbie O'Brien? Okay, Robbie O'Brien is a builder. I think he is sponsored by LMI. Like me, he also has a series of videos out there. And he has what he calls the three inch rule. And what that means is here's the edge of your guitar. He pokes out at three inches. And that's where he starts that scalp. So what you can do is make a note. Okay, I did this. I did this at three inches. And I had my bracing. Somebody say something or am I hearing it? No, I'm take a picture. Oh, okay. So, you have your brace. Come on in. Oh, I don't think I'm wrong. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I like you too, Linda. I love you. <laughs> so, as you have your braces, you know how high they were, you know how wide they were, you know what the shape was. So now as you start making changes, you can be very finite in what you're doing. You aren't guessing anymore. Because 
you can talk to three luthiers and come away with seven opinions. Mm -hmm. All right? Well, you got to do this. You got to do this. I used to do tap tone. I used to do deflection testing. And after a hundred of guitars, I've noticed that for what I do, patterns work. So you have to find what works for you, okay? There is no perfect guitar. Because if we had the perfect guitar, we'd all be building it. So once you have a baseline, now you know what you can do to adjust things. So if you keep a note, and you can even make little drawings on it. Here's where I did it last time. And now you can start adding consistency, and you get that cause-effect relationship. Make a note how thick your tops work. Now, the other little part about bracing is your glue. Uh, any high glue fanatics here? Any fish glue fanatics here? Any tight bond users? Okay. Uh, there, I'm not condemning tight bond. Tight bond spill a lot of good guitars. But tight bond does have an issue of fold group. Now, we're going to talk about glues, that glues are, are two kinds of glues. You have a curing glue, and you have a drying glue. Drying glue just means it dries. Your animal protein glues, fish glue, hot high glue, cold glue, old brown glue, these are drying glues. So, water's going to dissipate. Now tomorrow morning, you, you, you brace your top, you come down and you look at it, oh crap, I got an air gap here. The advantage with the animal glue is a little warm water, Work in a little glue, clamp it up, you're good. You have tight bond. Oh crap, I gotta work the old glue out. It's a curing glue. Because once it cures, it's done. The other thing about animal glues that I like over tight bond is you have a thinner glue film and it dries hard. Tight bond always is a little, it gets hard, but not hard like the animal glue. I'm not condemning either one. That's your choice because there have been great guitars built with tight bond, and there's been traffic guitars built with high glues. So pay very close attention to your joinery. If your joinery is not good, your guitar is not going to be good. So enjoy what you're doing and pay attention to those little details. So as you can see with using these templates and the halos, and you can make them very easy you can go down by Lexan, you can buy MDF. Now, the only problem with these little Lexans, if you drop them, the buggers break. So I, I started making all of my templates with MDF. Yeah, you can't see through it, but you can draw a line and see what you have. Now, when it comes to bracing again, what material? Uh, red spruce guys? Carpathian spruce guys? Sitka? Okay. I've actually built a pretty good guitar just going down to Home Depot and buying a 2 by 4 So, experiment. Don't be afraid to experiment. But don't make a lot of changes from one guitar to the other because you can get lost in the correlation of, let's say, well, I'm going to change this and I'm going to change the size of my bridge plate. That all can affect what's happening. So you might have success, but it was because you did something over here and you're assuming it was over here. Can I ask a question? You, anybody want to ask a question, way. feel free to. Yes. So before you move on from the, the glue, I've only built one guitar to use type bond for that. Um, part of the reason I guess I didn't use some one of the animal glues is because I've heard concerns about uh, moisture and humidity and you know, like bridge plate or bridges coming off, bright braces coming loose and stuff. So can you is there something you can say to address that? Concern? Yeah. Nine times out of ten, if you have a bridge come up, you would have you would have clamped it fairly. Uh, a what? What you said? Uh, you probably had a clamping failure, or you didn't prepare the glue joint properly. I've been using fish glue, and I experimented with it. Usually, you don't have a problem until you hit about 80 percent, but then you also have a problem with tight bond. You have a problem with all glues when you're at 80 percent. If you can maintain 45 to 55 percent, you really aren't going to have a problem. But you do have to be very precise in your joint preparation. Now, clamping time, you really got to be paying attention to how you clamp. Uh, I was with a school that you got to radius your, your bridge to match your top. Martin's been building guitars since 1833. They do them flat. I did the radiusing. All of those radius guitars <coughs> had problems. All of them. 
All of them either had finish cracks coming off at the corners of the bridge, or what would happen, the bridge, the top is, is dynamic, it's always moving. And it ended up flexing a bridge, so my saddle slot arched. My saddle did not fit dead in the saddle slot. I've been doing flat bridges ever after that. It seems counterintuitive. It seems like you would want to Well, think about this, okay? Here's your top. Here's your bridge. Here's your bridge plate. All right? Where's the most amount of wood? Right there. The top is always in flux. Once you brace the top, and this is another reason why you can tip and tap and tip and tap all you want. So you actually put it on the guitar, it's going to change. Now, are they wrong if those other people believe it? Of course not. You're welcome to do that. I've just found that I've had problems with the bracing structure. And again, I'm pretty much copying the market design. It just didn't work for the market design. Uh, what radius are you doing your tops at? Well, again, this is a classical guitar, sorry. <laughs> okay. I did a cost it already for that, but it's, it's a um, 15 foot radius for the top. Okay, and it's also a pinless bridge. No, I'm sorry, no, it's 25 for the, for the top, 15 for the back. And it's also a pinless bridge. Yeah. Yeah, but they can be a little bit more problematic than a pin bridge. And you also usually, did you have a spruce bridge plate? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that allowed the, let's put it this way, your bridge didn't come off your top, your top came off your bridge. I didn't just have to come off. Okay. I used tight knots. Okay. So I didn't. Use, I haven't used any, any animal glue so far. So. Okay. And, and again, just to see if the what concerns that I heard were there potential problems with humidity. So I, I didn't want to deal with that. And want my you know bridge popping off or anything. So I just stayed. There, there was one guy in one of the forums who was very, very much against fish glue, mm -hmm. and I got to talk to him. He never used it. <laughs> so you know, we, we all have opinions. So my best advice is do it. You know, if you make a mistake and you, it's a learning experience, it's no longer a mistake. You know. Um, high glue for gluing on the bridge. Yeah. What strength do you recommend? I use 193. 193. Yeah. There's How much open time do you have with that? What's that? How much open time do you have with that strength? 20 seconds. Uh, what I do, if I'm using hot high glue, I put a heat lamp on it. All right, and I want to make sure I'm a little warm. On your top, on your bridge, warm. Yeah, I warm everything up. That then that gives you about 35, 40 seconds. Um, I've actually, in fact, we had a discussion with somebody here. Uh, who here does never heard of Frank Ford? Okay, Frank Ford, Frets.com. Ever hear Frets.com? Frank Ford has been doing this for about 60 years, and he's also. He's not here this year, but he's been here pretty often. Um, cold high glue, I was at the school, it sucked until I tried it. The difference between hot high glue and the cold high glues is your clamping time. The cold high glue has urea formaldehyde added to it to keep it in a liquid state, and it will require a longer clamp time. When I clamp a bridge on, I don't even care if I, I did tight bond, I left that clamp up for 24 hours. Then I left it sit for another 24 hours, and then I put the strings on. I wanted to make sure the glue is cured or dry. And how you clamp is another thing. Uh, who here has not heard of glue star joints? A glue star joint. Um, I don't think it's so much that you starve the joint of glue. I think what you do is you compress the, the wood so hard that it doesn't allow the glue to get in between the cells. I use, I want my joint tight, I want to see glue come out, but I don't want to see clamp marks. So I make sure everything's well, you know, I make sure my joint is nice and tight, and my clamping force is enough that I know I'm snug, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not stressing my clamp to make the joint. Torrified wood, okay. I have built a number of guitars with torrified wood. They are a different animal in glue. Torrify, the torrifying process changes the wood cell. And it is no longer a water absorbent 
material like raw raw wood. Is it? Mm. Uh, most raw wood will absorb moisture from the glue and aid in the drying and curing time. The torification process, like I said, changes the way the water is absorbed. So you are going to need a lot more planting time. I built torrified tops with torrified braces, and I just left them sit for 24 hours, and then let them sit another 24 hours before I put them on the top. Um, the first time I used torrified braces and torrified tops, they, they popped right off. And I knew, the glue, the, I knew that the glue was good, so I had to find out what my failure was. So I did a lot of, of testing, and I found that while their bottle may say 12 hours, 24 at least. What's your opinion of torrified wood? What's your opinion of torrified wood? I love it. Oh, really? I love it. Uh, I think it was funny. What, what if you're uh, using a vacuum clamp? Uh, what, what, I mean, because well, the glue sets up quicker in the vacuum. I, so. I, have, I have vacuum clamps. Um, the, if you're using hot high glue, you can't use a vacuum bag. Uh, I would tell you whatever you do in your vacuum, give it probably an, another hour, because you are right. In a vacuum, the glue, the water comes out of the glue a lot quicker. Uh, I'm a gold water guy. For, I, I have vacuum. I just, for whatever reason, I really like the, the gold bars just because that's my technique. I don't have an issue either way. So you got to find an experiment that works for you. So I would tell you take a scrap piece of wood, glue up, do a clamp, and try to take it apart. And if you're going to pull wood up and break it, you know that your glue process works. Well, I, I, I used to use uh, hide all the time. I still use it like on, uh, I use it on my bridges and, and boards just so I can take them off if I need to. But uh, I went to LMI, uh, their yellow instrument glue, yeah. just for my for my tops and backs. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I couldn't get I couldn't get the hide on fast. Oh no, hot, hot hide glue putting a top on. I mean that is and yeah, it'll drive you nuts. The only advantage to the high glues over the other glues is that when you find that you have a loose spot, a little water, work a little glue, replant it. You I, I can't get it on fast enough. How do you how do you apply how do you apply it that fast? Well, I, I generally use either fish glue or the cold high glue for putting the tops on. Oh, cold high. The way Martin used to do it, they had a glue roll. 95 degrees. Okay. How would you like to work in that all? <laughs> it's 14 degrees out. <laughs> what do you mean by cold hide glue? Cold, uh, um, Franklin reformulated their high glue. Old brown glue. You've heard of old brown glue? Okay. It's, uh, it has the urea added so it stays in liquid state. You, you formed it with the uh, Franklin? Because I've yeah. talked to people that really, you know, the, I don't want to use that. You know, the, did they ever really use it? Uh, I've used it. I usually use it just for my extensions. Yes. I don't make them do. Yeah, yeah. I think for, uh, that's. I think the yeah. Franklin. Yeah. It, it. I've done a lot of testing with it. I've been using it for five years, and I, mean, I experimented it with it quite highly. Uh, when in doubt, you do a test joint, yeah. and if the test joint breaks the wood and you lift, you're lifting wood fibers, it's stronger than the wood. It's a viable glue. Yeah. Oh, oily wood, the fresh wood, fresh wood? Uh, yeah. Same way you do it. Yeah. Now, Coca-Bolo, yeah. for Coca-Bolo, I, I can't get near it anymore. Yeah, I'm saying that. Uh, I use tight bond on the neck blocks, and I use fish glue to put the top and the back one, but the fact is with the curfing, you really <laughs> not glue one of the sides. You kind of sand it, use acetone. Yeah, yeah, with Coca-Bolo, I'd sand the joint and glue it right away. I, uh, <laughs> Tom Kite works with a lot of coca yeah. I'm doing two right now, coca bowl. I'm using fish glue, and I have no issues. All right. Is there any particular brand of fish glue? Is there a fish glue for bindings? Um, like yeah. I use Norlin. Norlin. Norlin high tack fish glue. You feel like it's as strong as high glue? What's that? Fish glue? I think it's actually a little stronger. Okay. okay. Again, it comes to different strengths. Um, it, you know, my green. My cork, that's all my growing use when you build. Uh, fish glue has been around. You used it when you were a kid and didn't know it every time you lit the stand. Now, what is the soft water? About two years. Okay, about two years. 
So let me tell you this, anytime you're going to build a guitar, if you're going to spend 100 hours building a guitar, if you have a little glue, you know, $4.95, $5, do a test joint, buy a new bottle of glue. I, I mean, I, I go through a lot of glue, but even tight bond over time will, will, will go. So to do a test joint, I usually put one drop of wood on a piece of spruce, hold it for 30 seconds, let it sit there for about four hours, and pull it apart. Because I know in four hours, it's not really at its optimum strength. But if it's lifting wood fibers, then I can feel confident that the glue is indeed uh, solid. The, um, the bottle high glue, mm -hmm. the cold high glue, I, I didn't realize that was that good. Like, yeah. Uh, the older stuff you know, wasn't all that good. But do you, you know, if, if that works so well, then why use the hot stuff like that? Condition. Just tradition. I mean, hot high glue is, is a, a wonderful product, and I, I, I use it. You know, I don't use it all the time. I, I charge extra for using it because it is, uh, it's got its own problems. But it's, you know, when in doubt, do a joint, do a test joint. You, you will find that it's, it's not bad. But make sure your joints are clean, ready to go, and you want them tight. You don't want to see air. If you've got a force of joint, you're going to probably have a failure. Now, we were talking about consistency and bracing. Uh, who here knows the cube rule, the cube rule of, of wood? Okay? An example is, here's a one by one inch square piece of wood. Here is a two inch, a half inch piece of wood exact same amount of wood, all right? That's eight times stiffer than this. Uh, engineers in here? Any engineers? Mechanical? Okay. There is uh, ASC. You can go in and download Young's Laws of Elasticity. That you can, you can find all kinds of really scientific stuff about your wood. Okay. The cube group, cross-sectional shapes. You can play with this. If you take a little angle out of here, there's less wood, it's still it's stiff, but we're manipulating the yield strength and the, what we call the, yeah, the yield limit and the plastic limit, right? right? So that's what you're learning to do. Take these, the engineering, the scientific part of it, and turn it into art. So that's another thing that you want to maintain, and that's something that you can do with your, your halos. Put a little sticky on there, actually write on it what you did. Keep your laws. I did this, I got that. Because I can tell you how I build guitars, but you may not like my guitars. You know, there's more than one way to do this. And I cannot stress enough, you want your joints to be neat and clean. When you go to the engineering question for both of you guys, if you have your one inch square and you go to your half inch by two inch, yep. If you go to uh, three eighths and keep it at two inches and laminate, will you be stronger? Well, lamination. Now you're talking a comp uh, composite, right? So and are now, your laminates by nature stronger than a solid piece of wood, no matter absolutely. what the dimension is? Absolutely. So now, now again, you have another opportunity to play with a stiff equation. Yeah, it, it it takes another variability because it brings. A piece of wood, you can test this piece and you come over here and test this piece, you're gonna it's gonna be within the ASC chart, but this might be X and this might be X minus three. So by taking composites like you said, putting let's say you go spruce, ebony spruce, that's gonna be stiffer than you know, one piece of wood. You are correct. If your glue joint's good. Yeah, it's not. Okay, so if you if you have a problem with your glue joint, your laminated glue joint. Yeah, if you have a laminated glue joint, then you're then then you're kind of a foot, as we'd say in Dutch. You have to have the co cohesion between yeah. the joints. Right, and the type of glue that you're using, uh, that's where the animal glue and the high glue, they don't have a cold creep. Type bond does have a cold creep, so over time, I've seen Martin guitar and bridges move forward a good sixteenth of an inch. You know, the bridge is still attached, but the glue allowed it to float forward. It's rare, it is rare, 
but it does happen. In fact, on uh, trusses, they're not allowed to use tight bond in, in trusses. So what kind of adhesive would you recommend for making those kind of laminated braces? Uh, experiment. Experiment. And then experiment with humidity and the, the onset because you're going to have, if you're using the similar woods or you're changing the grain direction, wood is a hydro, hydro, hydroscopic. hydroscopic. It will absorb and release moisture. So now you have this going. Mm -hmm. And eventually it can fail. So you want to, type on might be the glue that you want to use there because it allows a certain amount of movement. I have not done any, I haven't done anything with laminating braces. I'm, I'm a, a carb like kind of brace, but I've seen people do that. I've also seen them where they laminated and drilled holes in them. That's what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe yeah, there's a lot of guys that do that. And I'm not going to tell you don't do it. I'm going to tell you do it and let me know how it works. Would you use epoxy? I know somebody uses it. Who uses hot hide? They do. Yeah. do carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. Yeah. Use hot hide. Carbon fiber is really strong, really light. Uh, yeah. But you you want to find the glue that's going to work for your situation. And for me to tell you what glue to use, uh, I would say find guys that are doing it and ask them. They probably know a lot more about that than I do. But I cannot stress enough to match your clamping time to your gluing curing time. All right, you'll read type on 45 minutes clamp time. I, I, I'm a clamp that let it overnight up. I, I really feel that way. So getting back to the consistency, when you look at what you can do, and you can do some testing, get, get some weight, take a brace, make your shape of your brace, put a weight on it. Keep adding weight until you get failure. Change your brain, your, your weight. You can also measure the deflection as the weight goes, so you can see uh, the bending moment of that beam, what, what, what it's doing. There was an article in one of the magazines on that. Yeah, and then you just do that, and you can, you can tweak your brace stiffness, and you can learn, actually have a number. Because so much of this is, you know, it's not voodoo. Uh, it's engineering that you're going to create into art. So what I did with a lot of my bracing was that. I, I set up a deflection test. You, you want to use a platform that's totally the same. Piece of plywood, say 16 inches long, 2 inches high. Put it in your drill press because you got a hole through the middle. Hang a weight on there and just keep adding weight. And you can measure, let's say 20 pounds, I have a quarter of an inch deflection at 25 pounds snap. This one here, I have 20 pounds, I have 3 eighths of an inch. At 25 pounds, I have a half an inch. So you can manipulate the stiffness of your brace and you will know what your brace is actually doing. Because when you cut a piece, when you get a piece of wood, you know, the Young's modus of elasticity is going to tell you what, what, what it's supposed to do, but it's amazing what that change of shape will do. Now the other thing I want you to understand is a top is being stressed, but there are multiple stresses happening to the top. So when you look at what you're doing on a top, and this is stuff that you, you can experiment at home with so you can really find out. Here's your saddle. Here's your neck and nut, and here's your strings. All right. Your strings are pulling on your guitar. And this is what your, your bracing is doing. It's now going to control the top so that the string transfer, the energy from the string into that guitar box, that's what you've got to manipulate to create your tone to create your volume, to create everything. You have the box that's full of air, the top that's going to move. That's going to compress the air to create the sound waves. So let's take a look what happens with the stresses. This is pulling, okay? This is tight. This is just pulling. All right, your neck is going to do this. This is pulling this way. So you've got forces heading that way. 
The other thing it's doing, this is full chromium and trying to make this rotate. And this is in tension. So we have multiple stresses happening here. Right here we have compression, but now we have rotation because we have a neck block and it wants to rotate. So now you've got a top that wants to do this and the back end wants to pull. If you take a piece of wood and you put 10 pounds of pressure on it, it's going to bow. If you take a piece of wood and you pull on it, it's going to carry the load a lot more efficiently. I can take a quarter inch piece of pine and glue it to a girder and hang from it. I can't stand on it. So now you've got to manipulate your braces and figure out how you can control these stresses. And this is, this is where, as you start building, you're going to figure out, well, if I take some here, if you take anything off up here, so this is your, let's say this is your brace, all right? And you start taking wood up here, you're, you're going to make the top floppy. The sad part is, you're taking strength away from the top. If you come down here where the action's happening, you want to be careful how you remove the braces, but down here you're putting the load more in a tensional load than a compressive load. So build yourself a guitar, make a big sound hole so you can get your fat arms in there, and take it to failure. Because once you learn where the failure happens, you know where not to go. My second guitar was the guitar I learned a good bit on. Because, oh, I built one guitar, not the same part. I built my second guitar. I burned it. I tried fixing that for, for years. I made everything that I thought I learned on the first guitar was basically, I was lucky. Then I took 14 guitars that I started building the next year and just kept taking them and tweaking them. 95% of you are going to overbuild your first 20 guitars. So if you build yourself, go buy the cheapest wood you can buy. Because we aren't worried so much tonality, although you do want to listen to it. You want to find at what point the structure fails. Because you know when the structure fails, that's catastrophic. Everything between there is going to be what you can get out of the guitar. Now, hopefully by next symposium, I have a friend, John Reed, is a physics professor at Lock Haven University. Another friend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> another friend, his name also is John, John Ridge, he used to drive, uh, write tech papers. And he came up for a voicing class a couple months ago, and I built a box, a trapezoidal box. And this is something that you can do. And I'll tell you what I learned from that so that you don't repeat my mistakes, but that you can actually learn by yourself. My trapezoidal box, I made it out of just pine, okay? And I figured the approximate volume of an OM guitar. Now, we actually have a guitar that we built that we can pull the top off, rebrace it, put that same top back on so that we can get an actual definitive, if I take this guitar and change this, I know what the result's going to be. And hopefully we'll have that, hopefully it'll work. Yeah. We're going to have spectrum analyzers and a bunch of college kids doing a lot of math. So, this part here, you build and screw on so it can come off. Where I And I just used the typical bolt-on neck. I'm, now, you don't have to worry about the neck action because we aren't really worried about a playable guitar because we want to hear. So what I did, and this is what I did that was wrong, I came down a quarter of an inch and I came in about well, five-eighths of an inch. And actually what happened, and this is what really got me thinking about stresses on the guitar, it pulled the top right through that data. So I would recommend eliminate this and just put on the front that. So you have the full three quarter of an inch against which the top can push. All right. Now you make your top. This you can still put your rabbit in. This is screwed in and make your top that fits in there nice and snug. Now you can brace your top. And I think I super glued my bridge on. 
And then what I would do is I would route the bridge off, I could sand my braces off right to the top, and then I could put different braces on. But what you want to do is put standard braces in it and then start carving. Listen to the difference. Now, don't try to play it, put a capo on it. And just keep plucking the string and listen. If you, I think you can get uh, uh, spectrum analyzers on, on smartphones. And you know, you know, then you can start looking because if you take a look at a string when it's plucked, it's not this. What it is is this. Okay. And what that's telling you, okay, you have a, a main wave of let's say an A, a four forty. But now you have wolf notes, you have noise, you have overtones. Now, you can sit here and look at this and, oh, God, this is driving me nuts. But as you start playing with this, you can start seeing different things happening, and you'll probably hear. Because some of this stuff's going to happen. The only way you'd be able to hear it is if you can wag your tail. So, you know, but you can take a look at this scientifically and actually find out what is it actually doing? Because looking at it from an engineering point to just a, a subjective over empirical data, you know, it's opinion. Now you can actually build this and say, you know, that sounds pretty good. And that's probably the way I learned the most about bracing a top. Because it is amazing what you can learn. A quarter of an inch piece of wood out of here makes a big difference over here. Right? Now, please ask some questions. I have a question. Yes, I am. I have a question going back to the bridge plate thing yes. you say about the, I don't, I, I, I make a flat bridge plate, but when I glue it on, I'll, I'll glue it on in my dish. So do I. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It still comes out pretty flat. Yeah, okay. I just thought it was a question I had there. Yeah, because what's going to happen, it's amazing how much wood can move from humidity. All right? So right here, in a way we put a composite here because we have maple and the grain's going to be running perpendicular to the top and then we have the ebony, again, running perpendicular to the top. So in a way that's almost a composite. Now, break angle. Who here thinks you have to have break angle at 45 degrees? Wonderful. Alan Cruz, who here, people here know Alan Cruz? He and I happened to do an experiment at about the same time about break angle. What I found about break angle, five degrees. Under five degrees, you're going to noticeably hear a difference. Above that, I, I physically could not hear a difference. And the reason why is when you're trying to figure out the energy transfer point, the energy transfer point is the top of the saddle to the point of connectivity down here at the ball end. Classical builders, the bridge also comes into it, and there's a lot of calculus involved, which is a little bit above my thinking at this moment. But you're going to have the centroid of the structure, and you're going to have a, a centroid of the force. And that is where the magic happens. How do you figure it out? I haven't got the slightest idea. But I've learned this is the magic point. How high the string is off of the top at the point of the, of the front of the bridge. Because when you think about it, we're fulcrum. The lower, the lower this comes, the less energy transfer. The higher this goes, the more stress. So you've got to find the point where you are overstressing your top. <coughs> And when you overstress your top, you, you tighten it up and it, it can really take away from the guitar. So you gotta play with that till you find that magic number. For me, it's right around 7 16 to a half of an inch. That's my goal. But how high is this top gonna go and move when it's under load? So these are all the things that you need to think about when you're building a guitar or designing your bracing pattern. Now this is for the X pattern, but it doesn't matter what you're building. It's all happening at the bridge, because that's where the force is being applied to the top. Yes, you have the compressive force coming from the neck, but 80% of what's happening in the guitar is happening back here. Because as that's moving, that's compressing the air, and that's creating 
the poems that we hear. Is there, what happens, uh, I mean, does it, does it change uh, the, the, the force if you have a radius top, mm -hmm. if you move the highest port of the point of that radius up toward the neck or down toward the tail? Well, there is a sweet point on the top, you know, where do the bridge placements happens. I'm a firm believer in natural selection. There's a reason why we see guitars where the bridges are. Okay, uh, Norm Blake, the 12 fret neck on the 14 fret body that Mark had done, moved everything down, I think about an inch, inch and a half. And it gave a very unique tonality to that guitar compared to the same body with the 14 fret neck. And yes, where that's moved is definitely going to change the way that the air works inside the box. Right? So you, you just think about this. How much bracing? Then we can uh, then we get into the weight and the mass uh, for bridge plates. You know, the bridge plate has to support the bridge. Alright? How big of a bridge plate do you need? Well, I am actually doing a lot where I don't put my bridge plate in until after I attach the bridge. That way I can drill through. I make my bridge plate so I know my bridge plate fits. But when I drill through my bridge, I now can slide in my bridge plate, make a mark, and I can set my bridge plate Okay, so when I go to set my bridge plate, alright, so here's my bridge, there's my saddle, here's my hole. Alright? I want my bridge plate to just be a little bit proud and just a little bit proud. So if you have a one and three eighth inch bridge, why do you need a two inch bridge plate? So now you can make your mark, drill your hole, you know where your bridge plate is, you know where the bridge is, now you know where to trim your bridge plate, which you take away mass down here, you're allowing more movement. But at the same token, how small can you get? Martin had one inch wide bridge plates in some of the old OM. Huh. One inch, which is exactly the width of the bridge. So that gives you an other point that you can play with to manipulate with the tone of your guitar. And again, by making one of these things, you don't have to say, John, now if I do this, I do this. Now you can go and do it and say, well, maybe I should have made an eight inch bigger. Experimenting with different bridge plate materials. All right, I've used maple, I've used Brazilian rosewood, I've used spruce with an ebony patch, I've used cherry, and I use black locust. Black locust, maple, everything else. I don't bother with everything else. All right, tuck bracing. Uh, the old Martins had tucked bracing. And you would think because of that additional mechanical grip that it would add something to, to the guitar. I don't really know if it does. You mean the bridge plate being tucked? Uh, Martin actually tucked the finger braces, the tone bars, and the bridge plate. And can I hear a difference? Like I said, mind your tail. What is their authentic series now? They still yeah, do yeah, they still do it. In fact, I I just had six pre-39 guitars in my shop since February. And all of them, you know, have the tuck bridges. All of them, what I noticed on the X-brace, here was your X-brace coming down. All right? Went the wrong way. Pop your X-brace, and here's a little notch here. And I noticed the bridge plate was always, had a gap in the back. And I couldn't figure out why. Was it sloppy workmanship? I discovered that if you ever have to you know, replace a bridge plate, it lets it slip out. Because to Martin, right. the bridge plate was sacrificial. Okay, to guitar geeks, and oh, well, you gotta have the original bridge plate. Well, I've actually learned to take a bridge plate out and repair it and put it back in. What does tuck mean? What's that? What does it mean when you say you're tucking the tucking the? Okay, what that means is they took the next brace. Anybody here have a pencil? I always come very poorly prepared. Who here has built Martin kits? 
Okay. I sell Martin kits and they help people build them. And they have the bracing laid out and they say, my bracing don't match. Well, you take the top one out, turn it 180 degrees and turn 90 degrees and now it works. I feel so stupid. I actually built a guitar like that. It was a good sounding guitar, but what happened is when I drilled my, my, my bridge pin, I drilled through the x -brace. It's one of the best sounding guitars I have. And it's still solid, believe it or not, even with two holes drilled through it. So, you know, sometimes a mistake is a discovery. Because no true discovery was ever made by status quo thinking. You know, some of my best mistakes, you know, they were either firewood or, oh, I got to remember to do that again. So by tuck brace, I'm sorry, I got, yeah, I, you know, ooh, I, thought, I thought you answered the question. I was like, my God, I missed that one. <laughs> okay, uh, can I borrow your pen a second, please? Okay, so if this is the X brace, thank you, by the way. You, are you going to take notes? Well, I <laughs> <laughs> So let's just say this is the area of the X brace, all right? I'm done. Thank you. I'm going to go over here and show them personally. And then you can pass this around. This area is actually cut out, and the bridge plate was notched and fit inside oh, okay. like a puzzle. Okay. All right? Anybody else want to see this? So, so that's the same line and just letting it run through the curving at the end. Would that have been considered tucking it? Yeah. But now they also did that with the tone bars. But what they did at the tone bars, I've seen examples where there was like a miter cut, and I've seen where they were through. I guess it depends on the guy doing it. You know, I mean, these guys did this all day long. They were good at what they did. So there are people who don't glue the bridge plate if they do the stucking method, or they and <coughs> and let the pressure just keep it in place. Oh no, no, it was still glued. Okay, it was okay. still glued. All right. Okay. So, oh. <laughs> the weight lifting. Bad breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay, main direction. Another thing that you can think about is grain direction. All right, it's amazing the direction of grain. I mean, obviously the wood can be most flexible across the grain and strongest in its length. Now, if you have a, a bridge plate, here's your bridge plate, right? Your top grain is this way. This grain goes this way. And here's your bridge hole, all your pin holes. All of your bridge pins are a wedge. How do you split firewood? Mm -hmm. Right? So when I make a bridge plate, I try to put my grain somewhat a little cattywampus. That also adds in the stiffness. And again, make an experiment. Play with it. Because I can tell you what I do, that's my opinion. You do it, it becomes fact. All right? The other thing I like to do, stress, rate, uh, stress riser control. Who here does not know what a stress riser is? You don't know what a stress riser is. A stress riser is what I'm going to call a focus point of stress. <laughs> Who remembers the comet? jet plane. Okay, first commercial successful jet airplane, the Comet. Wonderful, I can get to New York in four hours. After a couple of years, they're falling out of the sky. They had square windows. And what happened, the plane's flying, it's being pressurized, it's carrying the load on the wings, there's flexation, and next thing you know, it cracks. And guess what happens when a plane cracks in two? It becomes a rock. Same thing with your stresses. All right? So, and I can't prove this theory, but this is my own. So here, here's your brace. All right? Now, as you scallop the brace, you're going to do this. All right? That's a point. It's a Euclidean line. Radius. 
The only reason tonality, when you think about we're creating sound waves, we're creating movement, if it finds a point where it can move easier, that's the way it's going to go. Radius. Is it a fact? No, it's my opinion. And besides that, it looks prettier when you look inside the guitar. Mm -hmm. All right? Ken Everett does a, uh, one of his voicing things, mm -hmm. and he leaves this, uh, he leaves this phrasing flat, mm -hmm. which uh, he says is more strength that, you know, it's different opinion for everybody. You know, it's, I don't do it anymore. I did it for a little bit, but I don't, I don't do that anymore. I used to work for a company named Tyco, Tyco Electronics, and they had a stress lab because they would have to, we, we put things in airplanes, we put things in submarines, so they had to stress stuff. And they had this really neat thing, you put something in it, and it was like a hologram. And they could apply a stress to it, and you'd see isobars on the screen. And it is amazing, when you have a sharp point, that's where the energy wants to go. So, that's something that you can put in your noggin, you might, you might like the sound of a flat brace over a radius brace. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's different. It's blonde, it's redhead. What's your opinion? Just, I'm, I'm, I'm only trying to give you as much what I've learned. I'm not saying my way's right. I'm not saying his way's wrong. This is what I've learned. You go home and experiment because that's the only way you actually learn. Because we can share the information. I can share everything I know, but making simple experiments, and, and I think I said about the yield limit and the plastic limit. If ever you take a look at this chart, they'll have, okay, here's a weight, okay, here's a plastic limit. That means up to this point, everything goes, now all of a sudden, it moves. So you can make a brace that's good to X, but once you pass that point, now you're starting to get the deflection, which in a lot of times you want. Uh, crumple zones of cars. But back in the old days, they built tanks and people would die from concussions because that energy went to the, he got nailed. Now they have crumple zones. Take a look at people getting, look at an indie wreck. You see crap flying in the air and the guy gets up and he goes over and beats up the guy that hit him. <laughs> All right? They found that they can disperse the energy. So that's what you're trying to do. You're dispersing the energy of the strings as efficiently as you can into the top. So don't think of the guitar as a floor. It's not a joist. It's more like a drum. All right? We aren't, yes, there's loads going on, but your braces are not so much carrying a vertical load as a moving load. Yeah, there's some stresses involved there. But it's not a floor. However, I got to admit, there were some very good guitars that were built very, very heavy. Uh, Kasha, they built very heavy classicals, and they work. I had a D55 Gill, and it built like a tank. Yeah. It was sound. <laughs> One of the best guitars I ever built was a, a Beeswing Sapelli. And Sapelli can, that has a whole gamut of density. This thing was heavy. But that little triple O 12 fret could hold up its own against the D35. It was loud. And I managed to sell a couple of guitars because of that stupid thing. I, I notice a lot of times when I'm, when I'm voicing the guitar, uh, a lot of times when I'm getting a better tap tone with thicker, thicker braces. As I, take, as I take more wood off, sometimes it seems to vibrate less. Okay. And I've always been afraid to say, well, I want to leave it that heavy, that's where it really seems to be vibrating. But it, well, it scares me, so I always go <laughs> when, when I see people doing this, yeah. um, and I did that, yeah. that doesn't tell you much more than your structure is solid. Yeah. Okay. Dampening effects, when you have a solid piece of wood, you tap on it, yes, it's going to move. It's going to flex. How you make your braces to work with that top is what you have to figure out. Once you put the bracing on it, it's a whole different ballgame. Wayne Henderson's a very good friend of mine. Here, who does not know Wayne Henderson? Okay, Wayne Henderson builds guitars. And he's this nice little 70-year-old country boy. Really nice man. I have a, a Henderson guitar. In fact, I'm picking another one up next week. And he builds them to the old Martin way. 
But when he voices the top, he likes to carve the braces with his pocket knife. And he takes them to what he thinks is the point of failure, and then he puts the bridge plate on. That's his theory. Is it right? It works for him. So I'm not going to say it's right, it's wrong. Do it. Because you learn more from a failure than you do from a success. Don't be afraid to fail. Unless you're selling the guitar. John, what's your thoughts on uh, the perimeter of the top thinning it? And, like, for example, Taylor has that relief route that they now do mm -hmm. to create more of that speaker or drum. Theoretically, I guess that's what it's. Any marketing people here? Salesmen? Marketing. Yeah. If you believe it, it's true. <laughs> Just ask Trump. <laughs> you know, it's another it's another mechanism that can change the physics of the top that will give you something different. See, we have empirical data and we have subjective data. Empirical data is one pound, one foot, one foot, pound, and torque. Empirical data is <laughs> that's a pound. Okay? Opinion is going to supersede that. Who here has had a fat, left a, a fat change your opinion? Okay? Do so you get an opinion and you're going to believe that it, that's what it is? And it's going to take an act of God to make you change, even though that's flat. No, it ain't, it's green. Okay, you're colorblind. So you it's green, and it's flat. It's, it's just a marketing point. Does it do something different? Sure it does. Does it like it? Well, that's why there's wands. Brunettes and redheads. I'm still confused as to why, this goes back earlier, uh -huh. as to why you wouldn't radius the bottom of the bridge to match the radius of the top. That doesn't make sense to me, did you think? Okay. Martin's been building guitars since 1833. Right. They've never radiused it. Never. Do you radius the bridge plate? I have. Okay. It's thinner. Okay, here's what's going to happen. Remember we talked about stress rising. Okay, from an engineering standpoint, please correct me if I'm wrong. All right. I used to do this in Catholic school. But I wouldn't do for Milky Way. All right. Now, there, there is a misnomer about flat tops and arch tops. Okay, flat tops, as you well know, do have a little bit <coughs> this is a flat top. That's your radius top. Bridge plate. Bridge plate. Now, if you put a straight bridge plate in here, that's going to want to deform this so you no longer have a radius. You've got more of a flat, more of an elliptical curve. All right? <coughs> You just glued up your braces. You did it in a 28-foot dish. You pulled it out. It's not 28 foot. Because the wood is always in flux. So if you have your braces on here, because they're cross-grain, they're locking up the top. That's your grain direction. They're always moving one way or the other. So now you want to make a bridge. And you want to radius it. And this is only the reason why I don't do it. I learned this one, that in statics, we learn this kind of stuff. So now, you have a radius. Here's your bridge, right? The forces are being applied. It's rotating to the front. Right there, you have more force being applied on your top than back here. Because you have a sharp corner and a sharp line, you now have a focus point or a stress riser. What's that going to do to your top? Is it going to make it fail? Maybe not. Probably not. But it's going to change the way the force is applied to the top. Do it. If you like it, keep doing it. If you don't like it, do something else. Now, if you put a flat top and you put this radius on here, ebony is a much denser and harder wood than spruce. And you clamp that on there, now, that wants to crush into the wood. So, yeah, you want your bridge to match the top. 
So if you're going to radius your bridge, radius your bridge. Make it sure it matches the top. The only problem is tomorrow the humidity is going to change and the radius is going to change. That doesn't mean it's any better or any worse. I'm just saying that is why I don't do it as an engineering, from an engineering standpoint. And again, I am a very traditional Martin style builder. But I'm not going to get, condemn them to do it. I just told you what happened to me. I went through the Martin factory the other day. Mm -hmm. First time, great place to go. But they did say, they didn't raise the bridge, but they took it routed the top flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what they do there, the old days, and let me tell you why they do that. I'm an authorized marketer to repair. In the old days, they would pay a technician to lay the bridge down. They had a piece of tape. In fact, they had a masking piece of tape. They'd lift that. The tech would put that down there, and then he would hand scrape the finish off of the top out to the, just short to the edge of the bridge. And they put a slight radius in the top, not the way that you're thinking, just here on the curve. I got to draw it. Side profile. Here, this is a thin line of finish, all right? And they would just radius this a little bit so that they would come up on the finish. Then they got the idea, well, we don't want to pay this guy to scrape. We're going to put a piece of tape there. We're going to lift it and glue. Well, guess what? That piece of tape was about an eighth inch in all the way around. So now they eliminated glue surface area. And anybody here who's had a Martin guitar at some point, well, I get a piece of paper under there. I can get a pick underneath there. Boing! Off it came. So they hired an engineer who knew nothing about the cars, but knew a lot about flooring. And they spent a million dollars and built this machine. So now the CNC machine comes down and it routes about a 30 thousandths pocket into the top, and that's flat and true, and the bridge just drops right in. And if you ever had to take one of those bridges off, you could call him a lot of names. I don't even try to take them off, I just route them off anymore, because you just you destroy because you're trying to do a 30,000 drop down into the bridge to lift the joint, you just can't do it without damaging the finish. Yeah, but when they wrap that, isn't the top already braced and has a arch? Their, their tops are just about dead flat. And when you clamp that together, that becomes a composite, it's all flat. That, that, that's flat. You, if you put a straight edge on a Martin in front of the bridge, that's flat. Now you'll see a belly rise in the back, but the bridge pocket, the bridge structure, usually stays fairly flat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Why did they make that change? When? Yeah. When? How long was it? Uh, around. I think it was 13, 2013. Mm -hmm. See, Martin Guitars. All of us that love Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars did a lot of changing from 1833 to present. Back in the old days, they had their building forms, and Dave made a building form on the bandsaw, and Mike made a building form on the bandsaw, and they have 14 molds, and all of them have a little bit different. Then, as they got better equipment, and they went from using pine and mahogany, in 63, they moved from Morris Street to Sycamore Street. And at that point, they went to plywood, they were pattern made, and all of their molds were reasonably close to each other. Minor, you know, 15, 20, 30 thousandths, but nothing major. Old Martins, I've seen as much as a quarter of an inch off. Then again, they got CNC. So now we made them out of CNC plywood. And now they made them out of CNC aluminum, and they changed shapes just a little bit. Now the neck block area is flat. Martin used to do a dovetail neck where the neck block was dovetailed, they glue it in. Now it's solid. Now it goes to a CNC machine. The CNC reads it, cuts the neck pocket to match the neck. The tech goes over there, done. He might do a little scraping for the finish, but he's done. The skill was replaced by a machine. So now instead of paying him 20 bucks an hour, they're gonna pay you 15. It's economics. All right. So if you're going to build, you know, 300 guitars a week, buy a CNC machine. <laughs> right? A bunch of CNC machines. A bunch of CNC machines. <laughs> CNC is a wonderful tool. 
But I'm going to say this. If you really want to see something, look up the Union Pacific Big Boy. It was drawn by pencil, designed by slide rule, and beat to death by forges. One of the largest locomotives ever made. So kids who think CNC are great, buddy, if power ever goes down and you don't have a computer, how are you going to saw a tree? No, I, I have a CNC machine <coughs> and I found that probably 90% of, of its usefulness is creating jigs, fixtures, yeah. not so much as... Guess who's getting a CNC machine? <laughs> my, my son's my son's helping me, so yeah, we're we're, we're getting a CNC machine but too. It's been invaluable for that because there's always sure. that accuracy, and then I can change things quickly instead of spending two days creating a jig. And how long did it take you to learn to? Still learning. There is a learning curve. Uh, Doug Moore, who's also helping me with the video, is a CNC guy, and he said it's CNC. You just have to learn language. It's learning a language. Now, in my days when I went to school, do you remember the old ribbon tape and you pop the holes? Medusa. Oh, God. The old days, we used to have to do it. I mean, it was CNC, but with that punch card, with a punch tape. Um, yeah, we had a, a lagoon. We did what they called zero force engineering. It was EDM. All right? Now we used, we had wire EDM, we had punch EDM, and we had manual, well not manual, but typical end mill machines. And the rule was, put in a piece of wax, put in a scribe, run your machine, that way if you made a mistake, because one decimal point can make a lot of noise. We were in the shop having coffee, and all of a sudden we heard a hell of a racket. Uh, the guy did move a decimal point from 0 .005 to 0.500, and he drilled into a $3,000 Kurt CNC vice. He was not made employee of the month. <laughs> so, I hope that I'm giving you enough information so that you can go home. I'm not telling you to change your techniques, but now you can just take something as simple as the cross-sectional structure, how that will manipulate the stiffness of your brace because think about that. The neck's going this way, the bridge going this way. How many guitars have you seen that the sound bolt did that? Okay. When I build a guitar, I have a one and a half degree angle that I manufacture into my side for my neck and the fretboard. I have a flat zip spot from there to behind the bridge. And behind the bridge, I have approximately a 28 foot dome. Who here has not seen my video preparing the rims? you know, driving the bus. That gives me a three-point structure so you can influence stiffness and you can influence that plastic limit by the shape of your structure, which helps to distribute the forces and influence the way the top moves. Okay? So, just experiment. Have fun with it. And you can use for mic if you're real cheap, just use for mic and do something up and bang it. But that little box that I showed you, if, if you make one up, you will learn more by experimenting with your own braces than reading 20 books. Because you can read about riding a bike till you slide off and skin your knee, you don't know how to ride a bike. Okay, two things. I'm wondering if you can go over that box again because I didn't quite follow oh, okay. the drawing and stuff. And then second of all, with regard to bracing, um, do you, uh, for the classical guitar that I built based upon you know, the, the video and stuff, it used uh, quarter saw on the, the grain Yeah, lines. Yeah, that, that goes without saying. You want your, your one but, is perpendicular I think, as you can. And I have heard this um, at some other time that apparently flat sawn is stronger. It's, it's less stable, but it's supposedly stiffer uh, than quarter sawn. And I think this is according to Urban, uh, the can't pronounce it so I, yeah. Yeah. So, let me put it to you this way. Yeah. It's, it, now you are confusing strength with stiffness. Two different things. Mm -hmm. By stiffness, if we take a piece of wood that's vertical, it's going to take more to create the bending movement. And this is where the plastic limit and the yield limit start coming into effect. 
if you play it flat sawed, it's going to be a lot more flexible. Okay? So it's going to bow more. It may be able to carry more load because when it's vertical, you're getting a lot of these force lines coming in. And once you get one cell line to crack, that's the end of the fracture. This will give you a lot more flexibility. So go home, make yourself a little stress test. Well, that's the, um, I can't remember his name, but, um, one of the symposia yesterday. I've done it, actually. Uh -huh. He's he done the, the test. And he, he said he confirmed what, this, what I'm saying, which is counterintuitive to me. Uh, Chris Jenkins um, said he, um, that the flat sawn was stiffer. It was less stable. I mean, the quarter sawn is more stable in terms of you know, swelling and shrinking and stuff compared to flat sawn. But um, he said it was stiffer. And what he does is he actually, for his braces, um, he laminates two quarter inch pieces together to make a half inch, which he then carves down to. Okay, what's going to happen though, when, when, a, when a failure occurs, it goes with the grain. Which means if he has a crack, he's not going to have a vertical crack, he'll have right. a horizontal crack. And go and do your, your stress test. I, I will tell you that it's a lot more stable course on. But again, it's another tool that you can use to influence the way that the top is going to work as a mechanism. Uh, again, it's natural selection. Uh, there's not a lot of guys doing it. Again, it's something different. And again, you're building a, a guitar that its end result is going to be based on, you know, not empirical data, but subjective data. So if it looks good, I like it, I want to buy it. Sounds good, I want to buy it. Because there's people that, that love arch tops, there's people that hate them. It's just the tool that you can use to finesse that guitar to what you want. All right? But again, too, the cross-sectional shape will also influence the stiffness. It's all about controlling the plastic limit and the yield limit. I would, I would have to kind of, I don't know about the, in something small like that, I think that well, if you take a, you know, a big beam, a, you, know, you see them flat sawn, you see them quarter sawn, but you see the flat sawn twist and warp a lot more than you do the quarter sawn. So that there's, you're giving up one thing for another. So if you're building a guitar, you definitely want stability in your back pocket. Okay? So that is by far. And, and I, I can't think that the, the strength value is going to be all that much more over one piece of wood in the brain direction than the other. But, you know, if there is some, if you prove that there is some, then I'll have to take your word that it may be true. I've never experimented with it. And I will admit, I've seen some flat saw Martin braces that just happen to get through them shaped that way. The car is fine. So I think what he was talking about, though, he was talking about doing the laminate in, in a dish, so having two flat sawn pieces, mm -hmm. and then without shaping the brace, but just using the flat sawn and laminating the two pieces, once it's laminated, it holds the shape well, of the dish. And so he was creating strength. And, and that, that is absolutely true, because when he, when he glued that in, okay, that glue joint is now, that's exactly. where you, you've created a, you've bent the brace by glue, by the construction of it, not by bending it. Yeah. Which is, and okay, that, that yeah, makes sense, method, I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense to me, yeah, that would make sense, because you put the, like, like a book, the brain's this way. So yeah, I, I would agree that that would probably work, and you can use that it as was, a tool. It was not a bad method, and yeah. to think that you're not shaping your braces that way, you're just shaping it by gluing rather yeah. than sanding. Exactly. It would, it would seem like it would work. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure it would. And it, that probably would be a, a very stable brace for the most part. Just you have another glue joint to worry about. <coughs> so again, learn to do a very good glue joint. You gotta watch your time here. Okay? The box. Huh? The box. Oh, okay. The box and come and come and see me. But just I mean, I don't remember what the dimensions are. You email me and I I'll draw you up a little uh, you know, a little blueprint of what I use. Because uh, I don't remember the offhand side. I think the top part here was somewhere around 10, and I think the back was about 18, and this was 19 inches long. All right. Where my failure was, the bridge was coming into what I did. I did a nice rabbit joint, but I didn't left enough wood there to carry. I didn't 
think that the top was going to move forward like it did. So if you take this part where you put the neck block, and instead of cutting the groove in it, glue, glue like a, a quarter inch so that you can create a groove to carry the top, which can push against the three quarter inch uh, side so it won't go through the side. But that way you'll have a stable structure. And you, granted, it's not going to be a guitar per se, but it will help you understand that if I do this and you can work something to failure just by pulling the strings, carving at it, and keep working at it. Till, in fact, the back, the back was also removable and screwed on. So I could go in there and, and adjust the braces and take it to the point of failure. That is when you're going to find a, you know, that's, that's it. Find where this point of structure failure is and don't go there again. All right? Any more questions? Thank you so very much for your support.